I'm gonna go ahead and get this party started. It is a little bit after four, and I know people may bounce on in, but let's go ahead and get things going. So first things first, I am Lamitria, or I'm better known as Mimi at Clarity Fitness, and I'm one of the managers. And today, I wanted to go ahead and make sure you guys know, for those of you who are not part of the Clarity Fitness fam already, we are located in Decatur, Georgia, and we are one of the first body positive gyms. And so with that being said, we do not focus on weight, scale, measurements. It's all about our mental health and wealth. And we always keep positivity at our forefront. That's our pioneer. And so well, while we do these webinars, we use webinars so people who are not fairly uh, familiar with body positivity get different diversity and different perspective of what that pretty much means. And then we tie it into different um, circumstances, scenarios, and situations. So for this one, we have um, what is food justice and how can it be body positive? So most people are probably even wondering what does that mean? Well, we have Julie Nowak who will actually explain all of that for us in this webinar coming up. So with no further ado, I would like to go ahead and pass the mic over to Julie, and we're about to get a great webinar going for you guys today. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much to Clarity for, for having me. I um, love talking about these topics, so I'm happy to do that. So I'm Julie Nowak. Um, as you can see here, I am the founder of The Seasonal Body, which is a project focused on the intersections of nature, just, nature connection, food justice, body positivity, and disability justice. Um, I'll get into a bit about my own story and how I got into that work a bit later. Um, but this is the, the area of focus in my work. I have a background in working in the food justice world, which I will define, and working in public health and environmental nonprofit work. Um, so I've kind of had my hands in various types of works that intersect with these, with these areas. Um, and I came to pos body positivity as someone with a, he a history of eating disorders. Um, and yeah, have been making connections between these different movements. And I'm excited to explore that with you today. So, so I told you a bit about who I am. Um, today for this webinar, we're going to be digging into some of the terms and concepts that are in this world, you know, terms like food justice, body positivity, health at every size. Um, and we're going to examine specifically how the food justice movement um, has been guilty of being against the body positive movement and maybe some areas where it's actually helping the body positive movement and and also talking about how to incorporate this into our own personal lives and into our communities and interspersed we're going to have a couple um, activities that you can participate in or not. It might be handy to have something to write on um, but if that's not available to you right now you don't have to. You're welcome to participate however you feel comfortable um, and check in with yourself uh, as we go along. And as a content warning, I will be mentioning disordered eating and eating disorders, um, but not with any of the details of um, what that entails. I'm just mentioning um, for context and specific types of eating disorders without going into details about symptoms. Um, and uh, yeah, so to start, I want to uh, kind of ground us a bit here. I think it's helpful sometimes with these webinars when we feel so disconnected to each other. Um, it can be helpful to have something to ground us. So I learned this from someone named uh, Steve Hoskinson, who um, he has a, a psychology paradigm known as organic intelligence. And that's where I first learned this from in, uh, in honor of who I learned it from. So I just want you to get um, a comfortable position. And uh, we're not going to close our eyes, we're actually going to keep our eyes open. Because the goal of this exercise is to ground us in our physical environment, so that as we connect across this virtual environment, we will feel grounded where we are in our physical space even if we're not physically together. Um, so I want you to start by just looking around your space, where you are, um, the room you're in, um, and just let your eyes wander. And as they're wandering, 
I want you to notice if there's something that draws your attention, maybe something that looks pleasant or, or looks neutral, neither pleasant nor negative. But when you find something that you know you feel okay about, whether you feel good about it or you feel neutral about it, um, I want you to focus your eyes on it and take it in. What color is it? What shape is it? Is it uh, a harsh, jagged shape? Is it a smooth, rounded shape? Uh, how, how big is this object or point you're looking at? How much space does it take in the rest of the room? Does it mm, make you feel any feelings? Do you have any associations with it? Just take a moment to appreciate what it is, even if it's something abstract like a blank wall. <laughs> and as you and as you're looking at it, I want you to breathe slowly or however you can breathe in a way that feels good for you and your body. And after a moment of that, you can let your eyes wander again, looking around the room, taking in the other things. And after a moment of that, you can bring your eyes back to the screen. You can take a look at what's in the screen, the other people in the screen. Maybe you can notice what's in the background of them in their physical spaces what colors you see, what shapes you see. Um, you can also notice the uh, computer itself and the uh, screen presentation. And we can return together now. And uh, you don't have to keep looking at the screen. I mean, a, a nice thing about nature connection is being away from screen. So feel free to close your eyes and listen, check in every now and then if you want. But um, yeah, I, I hope we feel connected and together um, as we move on. So um, these are some of the concepts and terms I want us to talk about uh, before we really dig into how food justice and body positivity connect. So what are, what are these terms? So food justice, what do I mean when I say that? So food justice is a term for a broad movement that I would define as working towards making a more equitable, just, and sustainable food system. So you may have heard other terms like food security or food politics. Um, some use the term food sovereignty. Um, and these are all great terms too. I like the, the term food justice because I feel it encompasses the other terms. It's basically all all initiatives and efforts and thinking about um, how to make our world uh, more just and equitable and sustainable with the lens on food. So that includes everything all the way at the top from policy and government and globalization to at the, the level of, you know, the actual land itself, where uh, the land that uh, food is growing on to everyone in between. The, the people who grow the food, the people who transport the food, the people who cook the food and serve the food in restaurants, and all of us as eaters, uh, we are part of the food system because we, we eat food. Um, and so food justice work can look like everything from, uh, you know, school meal programs to community gardens to um, environmental policy for organic agriculture to, um, farm worker rights, all of these kind of things can fit within the umbrella term of food justice. So next on the list is nature connection. And I think this is a more of a straightforward term. It basically describes itself. It's connecting with nature. Um, 
in all of the ways it can entail. So that it can include food and, and how food grows, but it can also include being in the forest, being at a park, and uh, it can also include being indoors. You know, not all of us has access to parks and trails. Um, there are various reasons many people aren't able to actually spend time in nature, although I hope we can make it more accessible. And so even connecting to a plant indoors or um, listening to nature sounds on YouTube or something like that. These are all ways that we can connect with nature. And under this broad term of nature connection, you can find other terms like nature psychology, nature therapy, ecotherapy. And these terms are more focusing specifically on the health benefits of when we connect to nature. So not just like the social benefits and the environmental benefits, but specifically how our mental and our physical health um, can have benefits from that connect connection to nature. So the next few terms are, uh, well, body positivity, which is probably the one we're more familiar with compared to the other two, which is a term used to describe a broad movement to um, destigmatize bodies that look different. So uh, having a world that's accepting and embracing and supporting and loving all, all bodies, whether those bodies are different based on weight, uh, different ethnicities, abilities, um, all, all the different ways the bodies can, can look different, um, bring them all together um, and valuing them uh, is part of body positivity. Now, why these other terms? Well, some, some folks uh, in this movement have started to disassociate themselves with the term body positivity for a couple of reasons. One of them is as body positivity has become more mainstream, some feel it has been co-opted uh, by corporations um, to, to sell and to market. Um, and uh, so some people have been wanting to distance themselves because of that. Um, and also some feel that um, some, you know, some folks with, um, uh, <laughs> It sometimes represent sometimes the faces of people within the body positivity movement are actually folks who don't have marginalized bodies, and that's fine. It's great for those bodies to be included as well. But really, the core at body positivity is centralizing folks with marginalized experiences um, in in the context of their of their body specifically. So some have started using the term body liberation which is more of a way to um, more explicitly politicize this work that we're doing, that it's not just about loving your own body and it's not just about uh, normalizing bo the bodies look different. It's also about changing the larger society about how we think and talk about bodies. Um, and then this other term, body neutrality, this term is more um, often used on a new, on an individual level in contrast to body positivity because um, sometimes the pressure to feel positive about our bodies can be counterproductive. You know, some of us feel guilt that like, oh, I'm not loving my body today or there's this one part of me that I want to be positive about but I just can't get there. Um, and so body neutrality is this idea that um, let's just take the focus away from what our bodies look like altogether and focus on what our bodies are doing for us. So focus on, um, you know, our heart, our hearts pumping, getting us through the day and our lungs that are helping us breathe. And um, in, in those moments where, you know, we might feel we either have to love our body or judge our body, there's this middle ground where we can just, we can focus on what our body does as opposed to what it looks like. I personally use all of these terms depending on the context. Um, I've used body positivity in um, the title of this webinar and in a lot of the work I do because people are more familiar with it. Um, but I see value and context for, for all of these terms. Um, and you can, you know, resonate with one or the other more. Um, so the next term is healthism, which I would um, say can be part of some aspects of the body positivity movement, so, or specifically the critiques of healthism. So like other isms, like sexism, racism, um, healthism is another one of these isms where it's a term used to define a, um, an impressive system in this world. Um, 
So in this context, it's the defining our value based on health and over, over identifying individuals based, based on their health status and, um, and also often blaming the individual for, the, the, for their health status. Um, this can connect to body positivity because um, like for example, I'm someone with chronic illnesses and so sometimes I struggle with um, loving my body because it's sick. Um, dealing with yeah various symptoms um but if i can step away from the health as an aspect and say but my worth is not determined by whether i'm healthy or not my my worth is determined by me as a person and me and my as a person is completely separate from what my health status is whatever it is um and it, it also um, is important to note that our society puts a lot of emphasis on understanding health based on what an individual does. So understanding health in terms of um, what they eat and exercise, those are typically the main ways. We might include other things like, um, you know, psychology, things like that, but they're always framed on um, quote unquote lifestyle choices. Um, and it's not to say those things don't impact health, they, they do. But there's a much larger picture of that. Um, I didn't put this here on the slideshow, but another term that I think is important related to healthism is social determinants of health. And this is the idea that um, our lifestyle um, and what we're physically doing with our body uh, is only one small piece of the puzzle of the larger social picture of our health. So our health is in, impacted by, um, well, in relation to food justice, whether we have access to uh, certain types of food. It's impacted by economics. It's impacted by racism. It's impacted by um, our physical environment. Um, and uh, all of these have an impact on an individual and a community's health. And so they can be used as a way to challenge healthism by saying, um, this is a much bigger picture. We can talk about health as a um, systemic topic and a community topic as opposed to this individual, this individual, this individual, this individual. Um, and we can also um, take judgment and morality out of one individual based on um, their health status and you know, what, uh, what type of food they're eating or whether they're exercising. Um, and so this can definitely fit well under body positivity. Um, so this connects to the next term, which is health at every size, which is, um, I would say, the health focused aspect of body positivity. So some, some aspects of the body positivity movement say, like, you know, we're not determined by our health, so let's just not focus on that. And health at every size is saying, yes, that's true. But if you are going to talk about health, then let's do it in a body positive way. Um, and so kind of the core idea behind Health at Every Size, which is by the way, a registered trademark through the Association for Size, Diversity and Health. Full disclosure, I'm a member of ASDA, um, but they, uh, they do great work really um, digging into the scientific literature about weight science um, and also social determinants of health and um, having, a, having a more weight neutral approach to health. So some of the core tenets of health at every size are the idea that, um, you know, challenging the idea that um, health, that, that being fat equals being bad. And I should say, I use the term fat as a descriptor. Many in the body positivity movement have reclaimed the word fat. Um, and so I'm using that term um, to honor fat individuals who have said that that's the term that they prefer to be used um, as themselves and really emphasizing that fat is a descriptor like tall um, rather than it being a bad thing. Um, it's, a, it's a neutral descriptor um, it, as long as we uh, change the public dialogue about what it means to be fat. So. Um, so, as I was saying, so health at every size is challenging the idea that um, our health is determined by weight. You know, 
the traditional way of looking at this is to use the BMI, the um, body mass index, um, as classifying health. Um, and health at every size is saying the, the scientific literature just actually doesn't support that. Um, the BMI, uh, all it describes is a ratio of height to um, weight. Um, we've moralized what certain categories of there are. And it's true, there are sometimes correlations between weight and certain things in some of these studies. But the majority of these studies have not accounted for social determinants of health. So for example, um, weight stigma, which is stigma against people who have a higher weight, um, there is so much uh, medical academic research about the impacts of stigma on health. And so an individual who is fat, um, they experience that fat stigma. And so they, be, they um, experience oppression and stress related to that. And when they experience that, they, it is then a social determinant of health that is increasing their chances of being predisposed to certain health issues, including ones related to heart issues. So a fat individual then has a correlation with certain uh, heart health conditions. But all, all we know is that there's a correlation. Um, if the individual is having that correlation because they're fat or because they receive the stigma they're fat, that, like this dialogue is not happening in the regular mainstream. And in the studies that have um, accounted for um, some of these factors, which by the way is really hard to do, but like when they've compared, for example, um, even, even lifestyle things, um, like uh, diet and exercises, that if, in, if that's accounted for and individuals match those, that uh, there, aren't worse health, it, there aren't worse health outcomes for those with a higher weight. And so part of this with health at every size is really doing good research that is looking at all the variables um, and distinguishing between correlation and causation. That's a big part of their work. I would say another big part of the work is another area of um, scientific research that says the majority of people who experience weight loss through dieting um, will regain the weight back um, within a period of time. And so what the, what the research is showing is that like, yes, diets can work in a short-term basis, um, but not, not on a long-term basis. Um, yeah. I, I think that 80 to 90 percent of people who go on a weight loss diet will eventually gain the weight back. And so what that is saying is that um, the intention of losing weight doesn't work for most people. It will work for a few. It will work for a very small percentage of people. But this idea that we are pursuing weight loss because it's going to make people um, healthy it just doesn't make sense when it's just something that's not possible. And in fact, um, when people diet, especially yo-yo dieting, when you're dieting, going off and dieting, it can actually increase your, um, your set point weight. So your set point weight is a, um, a range that your body kind of naturally um, settles at. Um, it's not a specific number on the scale. It's usually a range and that range can be bigger or smaller for some people. Um, but that, that set point weight is kind of, it's very much tied to human evolution and biology and all these different factors. And when our bodies go through a period of starvation, which, which most types of dieting are, um, our bodies can go into starvation mode, which triggers to your system that your food system, your, sorry, your food sources are, are unreliable. Like if you look at this from an evolutionary perspective, as hunter gatherers, um, we have these biological mechanisms in place to, to help us survive, right? Um, and so when, uh, in, historically, in, from an evolutionary perspective, we went through a period of without as much access to food, um, our bodies would once it gets more food again, it would actually raise the set point weight so that in the future, if we lose access to that food again, we will have more stored fat so that we will be more likely to survive if we go through a period without food again. So it's this, this mechanism that's protecting your body 
for survival. Um, and so when we, when we go yo-yo dieting, um, that's part of what our bodies are doing. You know, we've, we've framed weight gain as a bad thing, but it's actually this beautiful evolutionary process that um, our bodies are capable of. And in fact, um, historically when, um, you know, famine was more common, um, although it still happens um, today, especially in certain parts of the world, um, people were more likely to survive if their set point weight was higher than those who, who were, you know, naturally quite thin. So um, all this to say, <laughs> weight science is very complicated, and, uh, but it's presented in the media as this very straightforward, end. you know, calories in, calories out. All you gotta do is uh, eat healthy food, eat a certain amount of food and exercise, and uh, you'll have a quote unquote healthy weight. And it turns out it's just so much more complex and uh, individual than that. And so health at every size is saying it doesn't make sense to be using this as a marker for health. Some people will be fat and very healthy. Some people will be thin and very unhealthy. Like me, I'm a thin person and I have multiple chronic illnesses. So they're really focused on um, looking at health through the lens of social justice, through the lens of social determinants of health, and with an, a weight neutral approach. Um, just keeping an eye on time. So uh, just real quick, these are, these are the principles of health at every size. Um, you can find more information about this on the ASDA website which is sizediversityandhealth.org. ASDA stands for the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. Um, so just one second, I have to, there we go. Um, so the first one is weight, whoops. <laughs> the first one is weight inclusivity. So the idea that like within this topic of health, we're gonna include all body sizes or all body weights. Um, health enhancement. So this is, this is, you know, really about um, once we remove weight from the picture of how we're talking about health, what are all the other components that we're talking about for our physical health, our mental health, our social health, all the aspects of health. Respectful care. Um, this is in part about um, removing weight stigma, especially within the medical system. So making sure that people of all weights receive appropriate health care. So for example, many people with chronic joint issues, including myself, I have a chronic joint pain condition. Um, folks like me who are thin, we're given recommendations. You know, I was told to try physio, try these exercises, um, try these different things to help with my knee and hip pain. Never once was it suggested to me that I should lose weight to help my joint issues. I was told all these other things, but it's so common for fat individuals in those kinds of contexts to be told, oh, just lose weight and that will help your hip and knee pain. Um, when, um, first of all, they might not, it may not be possible physically to lose weight. Um, and second of all, um, it's just missing the point of why they're seeing that doctor. <laughs> So uh, respectful care is about removing those biases that, that doctors have and really all of society has to make sure everyone gets the care they need. Um, and so people aren't as scared to go to their doctors. So eating, so the last two are more about like, okay, so where do eating and exercise fit into this? Because obviously they're still related to health. They're still part of the picture of health. And so the health at every size approach to these, so eating for well-being is really about, um, rather than following a specific diet, it's about learning to listen to what your body needs. So that can include mindful eating, intuitive eating, which I won't go into much here, but it's about learning to listen to your internal hunger cues um, and listen to what your body is craving when, how different foods make you feel, um, and using that as the decision factor as opposed to like, here's what someone recommended that I should do. Um, and life enhancing movement, um, kind of the same principle. It's about approaching um, physical movement from a place of joy and pleasure. And same, same thing with eating, approaching eating from a place of pleasure um, rather than, um, you know, some type of obligation. And it's acknowledging that 
different people have um, different activities they enjoy, different people have different abilities. So for example, I used to love really extreme hiking and because of my joint issues now, I, I just can't do that. And so, um, you know, part of, part of this is learning to find out what other physical activities work with my body that are, that are life enhancing movement as opposed to just strict exercise. So, um, how do we bring some of these concepts together? Specifically, food justice and body positivity. So, um, first I want to talk about the, the ways in which food justice is going against body positivity. Um, which, these are some things that I guess body, the body positivity movement would use to critique the food justice movement. Um, so some of the things I've seen from, you know, just being in this world um, professionally, um, but also in the media through food documentaries and stuff like that, um, uh, a common issue is fat shaming. So fat shaming is um, this idea um, that is very common in our society of um, either directly or indirectly shaming individuals who are fat, who have a higher weight. And that can be directly by making comments and liter like literally pointing the finger at someone who's fat and shaming them for it. But it can also be more subtle in the media. So for example, how this can play out with food justice is, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those big food documentaries like Food Inc um, or some of those where um, when they're talking about food justice and all the important reasons for it, um, one of the reasons that's emphasized is um, for people to, to lose weight. And they will use images of fat individuals in the, in the backdrop drop of what messaging they're saying. And sometimes it'll just be the body. You know, um, I've heard some folks call them fat, um, headless fatties, <laughs> where um, they, uh, they, they know, it's like they know this is shameful and so they don't want to put this the person's face because they're literally using someone's fat body to use their messaging about why it's important to have an equitable food system. So that's something that's, uh, I am seeing it a little bit less since the body positivity movement um, has been getting, you know, more mainstream in recent years, but it definitely still happens. Um, another issue, so the next three all kind of connect together, diet legalism, individualism, and moralizing food. And so sometimes, so even though at its core, the food justice movement is really focused on societal bigger structures, sometimes there's a tendency to focus on the individual. Like what can I as an individual do for the food justice movement? It's like, well, I, I could change what I eat. I could, I could buy all my food at the farmer's market. I could buy all organic. I could become vegan. I could do all these things. And it's not to say um, those things aren't beneficial. Um, I actually follow a plant-based diet myself. It, it's what feels um, good for me. The, the problem is, is that when so much is tied to those actions as being what's most important and ultimately um, what one individual does is not going to be what changes the most. And it can also be um, classist and ableist to imply that it does. Um, you know, many people don't financially have access to buying all of their food organic, or they might not have the physical ability to um, get to it, or they might live in a food desert, which is a, a term used to describe a region that doesn't uh, have many grocery stores in the area, like maybe a corner store or something. Um, and so this whole quote unquote voting with your dollar mentality is an individualistic consumer approach to social change. Um, and that's missing the point that the, this is a societal structural issue. And um, when we make it about the individual, we're putting blame and ownership on them. Um, and also we can get legalistic about it. So, um, so like, for example, if you're following an organic diet, uh, if you feel that it's wrong to eat one meal that's inorganic, I mean, you know, that's going against the grain of what body positivity is saying, which is like we're trying to get away from moralizing food. And I think sometimes the food justice movement does that. It does moralize food, unfortunately. And all of these things can lead to disordered eating, whether a full-blown eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia, or bulimia, or um, you can also have disordered eating where it's more of just thought patterns um, related to food, um, 
obsessing about food. Um, and it can even lead to a, a newer uh, understood uh, eating disorder eating disorder called orthorexia, which unlike the other typical ones, which are more weight centered, uh, orthorexia is an over obsession uh, with healthy food, however you define quote unquote healthy, whether that's like all unprocessed or um, all organic or all plant-based or all quote unquote clean eating. Um, and the, the part that makes it an eating disorder is not what you're actually eating. It's about the obsession with it. So you could have two people who um, are both vegan and one of them is approaching it in a very healthy way and the other person is approaching it in this like um, uh, moralistic and individualistic and obsessive kind of way where their own self-worth um, is being driven by following this diet in a legalistic way. And I know veganism specifically is controversial. I get it. I'm in the movement. Um, but it's not, it's not just um, veganism. So these are some of the ways that, um, yeah, I feel like food justice is in, con is in conflict with body positivity. But on the, on the, on the flip side, what are some ways um, that it's actually doing the opposite? Well, one of those ways is by, you know, doing the opposite of what the other list said. So being more weight neutral with messaging, focusing on systemic change rather than individual change, focusing on social determinants of health, uh, encouraging people to be listening to their bodies. But the one I really want to focus on is this last one, which is connecting to nature and connecting to our food systems. Um, because I feel like this is an area where food justice has something to bring to body positivity that I don't think body positivity can do on its own without it. And it's this idea that when we have a disconnection from nature and the seasons and where our food is coming from, that actually has an effect on our individual relationship with food and with our bodies. And so to, to dig into this more, I'm gonna tell you a bit about my own story. So. Um, without going into detail, I had a history of eating disorders um, during my university years, um, a combination of anorexia and bulimia. Um, after a couple years, I, for various reasons, I was able to stop the, um, the eating disorder behavior, uh, but I still had the disordered eating thoughts. I was still, um, even though I wasn't doing the most self-destructive practices, I was still obsessing about food um, and yeah, concerned about that. I, I mean, I, I thought I was quote unquote recovered from disordered eating, but it wasn't until many years later when I became involved with the food justice movement that I realized it was possible to have a different transformative and restorative relationship with food. And this was facilitated primarily when I was, um, I was interning on an organic vegetable farm uh, which I did for six months just to gain skills um, in this movement. And it ended up being a hugely transformative experience for all areas of my life. But one of the surprising areas was related to my relationship with food and my relationship with body, my body. And it seemed that the combination of factors, you know, one of it was um, I, like it meant for six months, 100% of my produce was um, organic, local, and the freshest possible, possibly even picked the same day. And so all of a sudden, my culinary experience transformed. Um, I was trying all these new recipes, and I was finding a way to find pleasure in joy that was about the sensory experience. Um, I also had a direct connection to growing the food. So it actually meant that I knew exactly where the, the food was coming from. I not only knew the farmer, I was the farmer. Um, and for me, being able to cook food that I had grown and being able to eat that same food gave me such an appreciation for the food that um, decentered my anxieties about um, weight and it, it just took the focus away from 
food being a fearful experience for me to this like sensory, pleasurable, um, connected experience. Um, there was also the element of um, being outside, which in general is just a very restorative person, you know, thing. Like we talked about nature therapy. Um, and, but I also, and also being in a, you know, a great community support, which also has studies have shown can be correlated to um, certain mental health conditions, including eating disorders. Um, but the, the big transition for me, I realized was um, my ability to connect more directly and intimately with nature from a seasonal systems perspective. Um, and what I mean is that I was, you know, I spent for six months, I, um, I physically experienced the change in seasons. So my body was getting more of the natural light, which um, can connect to our circadian rhythms. So on a daily basis, ebb and flow, my body was connecting more. But I also noticed my body was connecting to the changing seasons from like a climate uh, temperature perspective. And it really clued into me when um, I noticed in the fall when things were getting colder here, here in Toronto and Canada, it was starting to get colder, maybe not for you. Um, I noticed that I was feeling a lot hungrier and my physical activity hadn't changed. You know, I was still working on the farm and I started getting fearful that I was going to start eating more and I was going to gain weight because I still had all these fears about it. And then all of a sudden it clued in like, oh wait, maybe there's a reason my body is hungrier now. Like maybe the fact that it's cold outside and my body is hungrier is because my body's trying to store up for winter. And um, here uh, in colder climates, if you look at other animals in the winter, um, most mammals will gain weight in winter. You know, if you look at the squirrels here, um, you got all these little um, chubby little squirrels running around because they're storing up for winter. And so I started analyzing, um, taking that, you know, evolutionary perspective of why we, we gain weight and looking at it from a seasonal perspective. And I started noticing that there was a correlation between, um, this and also what was in season at the time. So I, so I noticed, for example, that, um, you know, I, this was the first time in my life where I had been eating completely in season for that period of time. And it seemed something clicked for my body that my body started to understand on an, like a core level what the season was. So when I was eating like tomatoes and cucumbers, um, in the summer, I was getting a refreshing, cooling experience, uh, you know, amidst the heat. And then in the fall, when things were getting cooler, um, I was eating like squashes and carrots and turnips and beets and like something heartier and nourishing and that you would typically cook and so it would be warming. And so it, it meant that what was being provided by nature in season was matching my own physiological needs in those moments. Um, and so, and the only reason I was able to experience that was by being in tune with these seasons, by being physically outside, but also eating the foods that correlated to these. Um, and this was, this was pretty revolutionary for me. And so since then, I've been looking at connecting to where food comes from and getting involved in food justice and just learning about where food comes from in general, for me has a very core relation to um, me being able to listen to my body, to tuning into my hunger signals without judgment and going through the ebbs of flow. Now your ebbs and flow might look different if you're in a warmer climate, but there's still ebbs and flows. There's still seasonal shifts. There's still times of year where some foods will grow and some won't. There's still, even if it's on a more subtle level, these, um, these cycles that, are, that our bodies can go in tune with. Now, I'm not saying this because I want these to be all these new food rules and to be another legalistic thing that we're supposed to do that we must eat in season 100% of the time or else we'll be out of sync and we won't know how to like listen to what our body needs. That's not what I'm saying. That's not accessible to people. And, you know, if I eat watermelon in winter, it's not like um, it's not, it's not necessarily going to like mess up the, the whole thing. But I think what it does is open up a way to think about okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat 
watermelon in winter, just, you know, think about, okay, what does that, what does that mean for my body? You know, if it's going to be a bit chillier, maybe after I eat the watermelon, maybe I eat something warm after or I drink something warm. Um, you know, it's kind of having a w awareness about it so that um, we're not being legalistic about it in any way whatsoever, you know, especially because um, from a cultural foods perspective, if someone, um, their family lineage is from a hot climate and they're living here in like cold Canada um, weather, like it's still important for them to connect to their cultural foods, which may be from a different climate or a different time of year. So there's no, there are no rules about it. It's more about being more aware and thinking about how these food items um, connect with how we're feeling. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, got to wrap this up. So we're gonna have to skip this. So just really quick, some, what can we do about this? So how can we bring it from this like bigger picture and bring it down to our individual lives? So what are some ways we can bring together food justice and body positivity in our own lives? So one thing very obvious, we can grow and cook our food. This is not accessible to everyone, you know, maybe um, if you have access to land, great. If you have a windowsill and you could grow some herbs, great. But if not, um, or if cooking is not accessible to you for many ways, there are lots of other things we can do. For example, we can learn about where, where our food comes from, um, both in a literal way and in a, a non-literal way. So we can literally try and trace where individual food comes from, whether that's asking the grocery store owner where they source their apples from, for example. I mean, you can get an idea. Sometimes the apple sticker will say. Um, any piece of information like that can definitely be helpful. But even if we don't have that information, we can, we can do that on a conceptual level and think about, okay, where might this apple have come from? Where are all the places in the world where it could have come from? And, you know, kind of think about that. Or if we're eating something with multiple ingredients, like a granola bar, you could say, okay, there are oats and chocolate in, in this granola bar. Where, where do I think those individual ingredients came from? And um, what would the original plants have looked like when they were growing? Um, who would have been involved with it? Who would have harvested it? Who would have transported it? Um, think about all the people involved um, and that can be part of the process of learning about where our food comes from and connecting to it and can also be part of a mindful eating practice as well. Mindful eating is not just about, you know, thinking about the sensory experience of, of eating and pleasure. It can also be about connecting to food on a more like deeper level. Um, so I also mentioned nature therapy here, which can be a formalized nature therapy program with a therapist or with a group, but it can also just be you connecting to nature in whatever way resonates with you, whether that's sitting at a park, going into a forest, connecting with a plant in your house, watching a nature video. And the idea is that um, being more mindful about it is, um, yeah, being mindful about the sensory experience and taking it all in. Um, yeah, there's so many ways you can practice nature therapy in, in your life. Another thing I have on here is you can join a food justice initiative. So in the effort of making this not an individualistic thing, because individualism will bring us down to us and our bodies and what we're putting into our bodies. If we can, if we join a community or a group or an initiative, it helps us zoom out and look at the bigger picture of what we're doing here and it takes the pressure off of what we're doing as an individual and it's a great way to co contribute to your community to a larger cause um, whether that's you know donating to a community garden fund or um, you know advocating for um, policy for government to implement certain policies to have more environmentally friendly agriculture um, maybe not in, in during COVID but like you know joining a community kitchen or something like that um, yeah. And then the last thing I have on here is food stories. And when I say food stories, I mean more kind of like on a cultural level or family level. So food, food has been part of every human's life in everywhere on earth for all of history. And that means we have so many food stories, um, from our families, from our ancestors, from our cultures, um, from other people's ancestors, culture and cultures. Um, and so learning about for like, you know, asking your grandparents, maybe a food memory they have from when they were a child can actually be a way to learn about 
your grandparent and learn about what was life for them back then and maybe something connected to your family. And so sharing these food stories um, within your family, within your own culture, and also with others can be a great way to um, have a different relationship with food that's simply focused on the health aspects of food. Um, so I think we're not going to have time for this, but I'll just explain what this is and you can do it on your own. Um, it's called Head, Heart, Hands, and it's just a, it's a, it's a facilitation activity um, that many people use to think about and implement what you've learned from this webinar. So you can draw a person or you can just write head, heart, hands. And um, the idea is that for your head, you, you write or you say, you can just think to yourself, what's something you learned or what's something you're thinking about after all this on a, like a cognitive level. Um, and then the heart is what's something you felt during this webinar or something you experienced or something that's resonating with you right now on a more like non-cerebral level. And then hands is um, more action focused. Like after this, what's something you're gonna do? Whether it's um, pursuing one of the things on the last list of you know, a, a way to bring food justice into your life, something, one of those things on those lists like resonated with you and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that. Um, or maybe um, you have the goal of sharing what you learned with someone else from this webinar, or maybe you have the goal to go research one of the topics I discussed that you wanna learn more about. So just on your own, um, you can write those things down or think those things down, <laughs> think those things down, think, uh, think what those things are. Um, and, um, yeah, so just, uh, I'd love to hear from, from you now, if you have any questions or if you want to share, um, any of those head, heart, hands things. Um, but, um, and if not, if we want to use the last couple minutes for, um, the practice visualization exercise I script, we could do that. But just for your own reference, if you want to get in touch with me or follow the work I'm doing um, with the Seasonal Body, you, my website is seasonal, seasonalbody.org. Um, and there I have some information about um, some of the educational service, services I um, offer. I do um, workshops like this and speaking and writing um, and uh, consulting for organizations or individuals who are trying to incorporate more of a food justice lens or incorporate nature connection into their programming. Um, and you can also, um, I share a lot of things related to the intersection of these topics as well as disability, which I didn't get into here, but it's also a big part of my work is disability justice. So I share um, things related to those topics um, on social media. I'm at Seasonal Body on Facebook and Twitter and at The Seasonal Body on Instagram. Um, so um, yeah, I'd love to hear from anyone who wants to pop in in the chat. Well, I would like to say thank you for this webinar. Definitely, it definitely made me think a little bit more because I did not think about the whole how mammals during the winter, they, we do the same thing, but it's like we didn't, I didn't put that in perspective, um, how you mentioned the squirrels, and of course I think about bears and so forth, but I didn't put that in perspective of we do the same thing, our taste palettes change with the seasons, things that you're like um, wanting or like you're like feeling for when it comes to that, that season, you're like, oh, it, it now register with me now with the whole food justice and our, um, I guess our um, mindful eating and so forth. It just let me put that now together. And I didn't think about it that way. And I also didn't think about, um, of course, how you can connect better with your food when you do a, when you grow your own food, should I say. I've never, I've never had the opportunity to do that. Um, I have started following more people on Instagram that are planting more carrots and tomatoes and peppers and so forth. And I, I've never had the green thumb for that. So I probably won't be doing it. <laughs> but I did think that was actually like, you do have a better appreciation for the food and you do have a different connection with it when you actually are growing it. Um, and I think a lot of us take that for granted, actually, because we just go to the store and we don't even try to figure out where it's come from or how. I mean, it's some food, like maybe some meat. So you may try to see where it came from. But we really don't take the time to really see where our food is coming from or how it was farmed or raised and so forth. So that put a lot of things in perspective for me, I must say. 
Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And also just to clarify, um, yeah, none of this is to say that if you don't do those things that you're not capable of having a healthy relationship with food in your, your bodies. Um, and I wouldn't want anyone to ever feel obligated to, you know, I know that for like some people have trauma related to nature um, or um, for various reasons related to marginalization and various things, growing food and spending time in nature can be not a safe experience for individuals, um, especially um, those with, um, you know, folks who had forced labor related to farming, for example, in their family history can have a complicated relationship. And so I think like, that's also why I want to be really careful about making sure I talk about this in a way of like, the reason this is here is to, you know, give you ideas about just the different ways we can approach this and think about this. Um, and also, as you said, like so many people are posting on Instagram now with pictures of them growing food. And so, we can connect to people growing food, even if we're not able to do it ourselves, even if we don't have the, the green thumb to it for it. Um, yeah, there, there are so many uh, options now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure if we're going to get any more um, questions, but I do want to um, thank you so much for um, this presentation. I came out and I, I can say for sure, I didn't know much about uh, food justice and how it registered or connected with body positivity. But I will say it's the same thing as saying mind, body and food connection, all that's like wrapped up into one. And we don't look at it that way, but it definitely is. And so I would say like at Clarity Fitness, we always are preaching or one of our models is like more mental health and wealth versus worrying about um, the body's weight scale or measurements and so forth. And I think now it's almost able to, how we tell people to um, do mindful eating or intuitive eating, it goes hand in hand with just having more of that connection with your food. And that can probably help with like some of our um, members who may have certain eating um, disorders or so forth, which we don't like hit on ourselves because I'm not a doctor at all or a therapist. But I will say that definitely does help to have that connection with your food and just be mindful of that, that it definitely helps everything that you basically explained in this. Everyone can take their perspective on it and kind of take pull something from it to help them in their own personal experience or something they're dealing with. And so that's another reason why we do these webinars, because things come from different perspectives. You learn different things. They bring us all some type of knowledge that we did not have. And they say you learn something new every day. So today, at this time, four o'clock to five, this is my moment of learning something new. And we definitely appreciate you, Julie. I will say, um, just to tie everything in with clarity, you guys, we do these webinars. We try to do at least um, one or two a month, definitely try to do at least two a month. And we try to get different perspectives. Um, we try to bring on different people. Julie was a great one, which I did. I um, found you on at Health at Every Size and appreciate it because it ties in again with the body positive um, brand and mission that we have at Clarity. Um, but we try to do these at least twice a month. So we'll have two more for you guys in the month of October. And then I do wanna go ahead and make sure I plug in that we do have a little monthly um, promotion. We do them every month, but the one for this month will be that we do have a promotion of $150 value that basically you get with the management team and you'll go ahead and um, get a movement walkthrough. Of course, we'll talk to you about what you're coming in for, what you're needing, um, and what your expectations are. And we'll kind of break all that down for you before you try to join our gym or would like to. And also, I know you don't live here, Julie. You live in Canada. But if you know anybody in the area, please send them our way because we're one of the only that we know of true body positive gyms. And um, everybody is granted a free trial before they come in. But we do memberships, personal training, virtual classes for now. But we do have a uh, space for the classes to be held within the gym. We would love for you to come visit us whenever you have time. <laughs> we'll try to make that happen. We would love to get you on again for another webinar. We would love for you to spread this. This is something that I guess, it's almost like the body positivity movement. The food justice is not as prominent as it should be, but I promise it will probably make its way just like the body positivity movement is making its way. And eventually we'll see some change in both of these. But 
again, I thank you, thank you, thank you for this because this was definitely helpful for me. I would definitely speak from my perspective. This was a very helpful, informative, and knowledgeable um, webinar. So thank you, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I love that you're a body positive gym doing this work and doing these webinars. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So with no further ado, if we don't have any questions, we will go ahead and say our goodbyes, but this will not be the last goodbye because again, Julie, we would like to see you again. Yeah, sure. So I hope everyone enjoys their day and we will have this up and running on our YouTube and you can also get a copy of this usually if you would like, but this will be on the YouTube channel coming up soon. And you'll find that at Clarity Fitness on YouTube. <laughs> Y'all have a great day. And what's the Clarity uh, Fitness website? That's going to be actually ClarityFitness.com as well. Everything is Clarity Fitness. We are easy to find. Yeah. And we're also on Facebook. So, of course, if you're going to look on YouTube, you can look on Facebook, Instagram, um, and, of course, our website. Everything's going to be at Clarity Fitness. Thank you. Have a great one. <laughs> Talk to y'all soon.